And it's now my honor and privilege to welcome Mr. Arthur Kurzweil, who is a good friend, member of the board, and all around good guy, to come and help us dwell into the talk. So first, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Meni and Rabbi Amichaya for coming here today and, uh, and learning with us. It's been uh, quite a remarkable experience. I remember there was a time when, when Rabbi Steinzeltz told me a little story that he was on a panel of three or four people. Each person was supposed to deliver a lecture about one Hasidic Rebbe. And he, t he told me that there was somebody there, actually it was Art Green, who gave a talk, obviously, on Rabbi Nachman. And Rabbi Steinzaltz gave a talk about Rabbi Simcha, Simcha Bunim of Pshishka. Rabbi Steinzaltz told me that after the lecture was over, the, the, the event was over, um, Rabbi Steinzaltz said that Art Green did a much better job than him in, in every way. He was more organized than Rabbi Steinzaltz was, he said. He did more research, he had more footnotes, more, more, more quotations. But Rabbi Sandel said, see the difference between what Art Green was trying to do and what I was trying to do is that Art Green was trying to give a lecture about Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Sandel said, I was trying to hold a seance. <laughs> I was trying to bring Rabbi, Rabbi Pshishka Bunim Pshishka here. Now, Thank God we don't need a seance for Rabbi Steinzeltz. He's alive and well and in Yerushalayim, but there's no doubt in my mind that both of you have brought uh, a, a, a piece of his spirit here, and um, I speak for everybody that we're, we're quite grateful. <laughs> um, I want to talk about two, two things that I find to be important when dealing with Rabbi Steinzeltz's work. Um, Two, di two different principles that, that I go by. The first is that um, 38 years ago, the first time I ever met Rabbi Steinzeltz, I, I asked him a question about marijuana. I told him that I had a friend who smoked marijuana. <laughs> that wasn't funny. That was funny. And, I, and I asked the rabbi, what does he think of marijuana? And, and the rabbi Steinzeltz said to me that there are t two things. He said, one, he said, I, I never smoked it, so I can't tell you from personal experience. But he said, the other principle, the other idea about marijuana is that there's really no problem with marijuana. He said, maybe it's illegal some places, so that could possibly be a problem. But in actuality, he said, the question with marijuana is the same question with everything in life. And that is, who is the master and who is the slave? If you're the master, then you have nothing to worry about. If you're the slave, then you have, you have plenty to worry about. So I put that together with an incident that happened to me with Rabbi Steinzoltz, where he was here in New York a number of years back, and there was a synagogue Saturday night that was going to have a, uh, a, lect a lecture by Rabbi Steinzoltz. And it was my responsibility to take the rabbi to this um, modern Orthodox synagogue. And when Rabbi Steinzoltz walked into the room, he had with him a bottle of schnapps, and a whole pile of cups. And he went around the room before he spoke, giving out cups and pouring and pouring drinks for, for each of the people. And then at, he got up to speak, and Rabbi Sandals gave a, a lecture for about an hour and a half. I, I would say the lecture, the theme of the lecture was the benefits of getting drunk. <laughs> the now, when he said drunk, he didn't mean unruly drunk. He meant the benefits of getting a little bit unstable. That if you get a little bit unstable, you can you can receive. What is this guy talking about, right? <laughs> if, you, if you get a little bit unstable, that somehow that instability opens up a crack, and and, and allows things to, to come in. So I, the, 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 let's take a look for a moment at page thirty one. It's the the soul the soul and God. Because my, my assignment was to talk for a few minutes about a close a close reading of, of this chapter. Now, in, in 15, 20 minutes, one cannot do a close reading of almost anything. Uh, but 
I, I want to take a look for, for a moment uh, at the first few lines of the chapter. First of all, when I see the title of the chapter, The Soul and God, I know that I'm in trouble to begin with. Because, as Rabbi Seinfeld points out in the 13 Petal Rose, there's no way to conceive of the soul. At a, at, at a human highest intellect, there's no, no way to conceive of the soul. Equally, there's no way to conceive of, of, of the Almighty. There's no way to conceive of God. So the soul and God are two inconceivable things that I have to begin to try to study about. And the, the chapter begins, if your unique personality compels you to contemplate your soul in a serious manner, you are probably someone who has reached, who has, I beg your pardon, who has a high level of spiritual curiosity and is likely that you will reach out to God often, even on an ordinary day. Others, however, need a powerful awakening, a jolting experience of some sort, such as a tragedy or a miracle to arouse such thoughts. If I then go back to page 15, and you don't have it with you, but I'll, uh, unless you have it in, the, in, in this edition, uh, the rabbi says in the middle of the page, a second important influence on how the soul manifests is the level of the soul itself. A high soul is a clear, strong soul, and whoever has such a soul is more strongly aware of it than someone whose soul is small or low. The distinction between a great or high soul and a small or low soul does not have to do with talent, and certainly not with actions. The level of the soul is simply a trait that exists within each of us. There are people whose great, whose great souls will be revealed in everything they do, in their breadth of vision, in the loftiness of their desires, in the ability to perceive hidden spiritual heights. At root, the difference between high and low souls is the difference between those whose souls are based on expansive vision and lofty goals and those whose desires and horizons are narrow and confined. These differences are unrelated to anything that can be explained in terms of material existence. God distributes souls in a manner that seems arbitrary to us. So, if, so going back to the, that first page of the soul and God, the third word in the, in the chapter is one that I could stay on all day. If your you, unique personality, your unique personality. Uh, one of the threads that runs through the 13 petal rose is the notion that each of us is individual and I'm not supposed to be you and you're not supposed to be me. Now having lived in the orthodox world for three, four decades, it seems to me that all people are doing is trying to be the other guy, and a lot, a lot of mimicry and a lot, a lot of imitation. But, 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 Rabbi Steinsaltz, over and over and over again in the Thirteen Petal Rose, as well as right here, is say, if your unique personality, you're unique, you are unique, and one has to measure against yourself, not not against somebody else. So it, it, it brings me to the point that I, the most important point that I wanted to make, which is a conversation that I had with Rabbi Steinzeltz a number of years ago about this book, The Thirteen Petal Rose. I said to Rabbi Steinzeltz that I noticed that in The Thirteen Petal Rose there are threads that run through the book. In fact, I quoted for the, um, the late Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan. He did a translation and commentary on the Bahir. And in this book, Rabbi Kaplan says that the only way you're supposed to study a Kabbalistic text is to find the threads that run through the text, so that the chapter titles are often uh, are often uh, distracting. You think that you're reading a chapter and it's about the title of the chapter, but when you read and read and read and study and study and study, you get the sense that rather than the chapter titles being the important thing, it's the threads that run through through the book that become the important things. In the 13 13 Pell and Rose, I identified three or four threads that I felt were in every single chapter, every single chapter, and asked Rabbi Seinfeld whether or not he agreed with me that these were major threads that run through the book, and I'm happy to report that he did say that uh, those were indeed th major threads that, that run through the book. So I'm suggesting that this, is not, this book, The Soul, is not a book to read. 
You can't read this book. You have to study this book. You have to read it quickly once and then go back a second time and then a third time and then you begin to pick up ideas that run through every single chapter and you discover those threads that run through the chapter rather than the more obvious topics that might actually not be, be the point. So just one last thing. If you've heard this before, I apologize, but it's worth saying uh, a second time, particularly for all of us who are here today and the teachers who are among us. I once got a phone call from a rabbi who was the head of a, of a yeshiva on Long Island. And he said to me, I understand that you're driving Rabbi Steinsaltz to a synagogue also on Long Island that the next evening. Um, is that correct? I said, yes, I'm um, the rabbi's driver and I'll be taking him there. So the rabbi on the phone said, I'm the head of the yeshiva uh, here in Nassau County. And um, my students, they learn from Rabbi Steinsaltz's yeshiva. Wouldn't it be great if Rabbi Steinsaltz could come and, and, and speak to the students? And I said to the rabbi, yes, it would be great. I'm sure it would be great. But we have a very tight schedule. I don't think we can do it. Well, this rabbi, he pleaded with me. He said, I'm telling you, the, can't you imagine what an important moment it would be for these students to meet Rabbi Steinzel? After all, every day they're learning from his Gemara. And I said, yes, I know that, that it would be great, but we just don't have the time. So the guy said to me, the rabbi said to me, <laughs> the guy, the rabbi, said to, the rabbi said to me, look, how about if I have the students in the auditorium, they'll be sitting there waiting, waiting for you. All you have to do is come to the yeshiva, come in for two seconds, and the rabbi will just say hello to the students, and then you can. And I said to the rabbi, look, I, I grew up not far from where your yeshiva is. I know the area pretty well. If tomorrow at two o'clock in the afternoon, you can promise me that the students will be in the auditorium, um, we'll do just that, and that's just what happened. We drove up, we drove up to this, the um, yeshiva, uh, parked in front, we went in, the students were there in the auditorium waiting for us. Rabbi Steindels gets in front of the students and says, students, I'd like to, I, I don't know, he said, I remember, the Rabbi Steindels said, I don't know that much about that many things. So already I'm skeptical. <laughs> but, but he said, I don't know that much about that many things, but I do know a little bit about Torah study. So I'd like to give you some advice about your Torah study. My advice to you is this. Make the lives of your teachers as miserable as you possibly can. Make your lives miserable. Make their lives miserable. Ask them questions you don't think they can answer. Trip them up on, on contradictions they may have expressed. Rabbi Sandals even gave the students a, a source of a certain book that gives you particularly difficult questions about each of the Torah portions of the week. Make the lives of your teachers as miserable as you possibly can, and off he walked. <laughs> well, the head of the yeshiva came back to the podium and said, students, I want to, on behalf of the school, I want to thank Rabbi Steinzeltz for taking a few moments from his busy schedule to, to greet us today, but I just want to say, please, don't take the rabbi too literally. <laughs> At which point Rabbi Steinzeltz, who was walking off of the stage, turned around, came back to the, uh, to the podium, grabbed the microphone, and said, students, I've been misquoted many times in my career. I don't want to be misquoted this afternoon. My message to you is simple. Make the lives of your teachers as miserable as you possibly can. Thank you very much. So we have teachers here today who um, who uh, we want to uh, live up to Rabbi Steinzeltz's words and, and, and make their lives as miserable as we possibly can. Sir, you take questions now or later on your... Is it just like miserable? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I want to interrupt. Jeff. You, you mentioned the threads yeah. in yes. the book. Can, can I ask you what are some of the threads uh, that you uh, alluded to? In, the, in this book? In this book, yeah. Just, well, uh, well you know, I'm... I'm I'm, I've just read the book three or four times already. I've not yet gotten to the point where I can identify threads. Um, the only one that comes to quick comes to mind, and uh, Gay and I were talking about it before. The rabbi uses the word epiphany a lot throughout the book, and I was wondering what the Hebrew for epiphany is. Yeah. Right. So, Gay, what did we find? Um, Sorry. to get to a point where you are able to experience revelation, but it involves a lot of work. 
So I, we found it in the Hebrew, and the, the word that was used, I thought, where epiphany was, was uh, kisharon, like a, almost like a talent to get to that high level. Tell me where it is all. Well, it's, it's, it's that same chapter, uh, the soul and soul and God. Yeah. Page 37. Anyway, uh, Jeff, I would say that the rabbi's notion of what this epiphany is, 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 uh, building, is building a thread there. Uh, next year we'll talk some more about the threads that we'll discover. Thank you.